testing, one, two, three, testing. Can you hear me? Good. First of all, I want to thank you for being here. Thank Wendy for inviting me to speak with you tonight. Realizing that many of my subjects are rather controversial at best, and more often than not, I tend to offend some people when I don't really mean to. But I have, um, I have dedicated my life to uncovering facts about life and the life that we live. Steve Allen once said that uh, there are two kinds of facts, the kind you look up and the kind you make up. And too much of our world is comprised of educated people who are teaching facts which are made up. They have no basis in actual fact. And in the Jewish religion, there's a concept in Judaism that says if you tell a lie when under testimony, then your entire testimony is to be thrown out. Because if you lie one time, you're just a liar. And consequently, your testimony is of no value, period. That being the case, there is a, moder uh, there is a, a maxim in Roman law. I want to read this to you. In Roman law, there is a maximum that says, let him who wishes to be deceived, be deceived. So that was an article of Roman law. If you're so stupid that you want to buy into something and be deceived, hey, go ahead. That's, that's up to you. Let me give you an example of how we are being manipulated and exploited by people who would present their notions as true and point of fact having no factual basis at all. Here in the Talmud, in the book of the Talmud, in Gittin, G-I-T-T-I-N, which is the name of a book within the Talmud, Gittin 57b says this. Now this is the Holy Talmud of the Hebrews. And Gittin 57b says, quote, that four billion Jews were killed by Romans in the city of Bethar. B-E-T-H-A-R. Four billion Jews were killed by the Romans in the city of Betar. Four billion Jews killed. In Gittin 58a, the Talmud says, quote, that 16 million children were wrapped in scrolls and burned alive by the Romans. End quote. 16 million children burned by the Romans. Four billion people killed. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it, it is part and parcel of what I have come to learn about theology in the 43 years I've been looking at theology. There's a very important question you might want to ask yourself. How important is it really to know the truth about anything, especially in America? How really important is it to know the truth, the factual truth about anything? If you, uh, if you have a rope and you're going to ship a heavy box, you take the rope and you wrap the box up with it, most likely that rope is going to be sufficient to ship any kind of a box. But if you're going to take that rope out to the edge of a 10-story building and you're going to hang your body off the building on that rope, now you better check the integrity of that rope because now you're hanging your life on it. Consequently, if you own the second story building and you're up on the second floor and you're going to put a lot of heavy weight on that floor, the smart thing to do, logic would tell you, is to go up on the second, go down to the first floor and get on a ladder and pull the ceiling tiles away and check the foundations of that floor to see if the weight is going to be too much for, what those, for the floor to make sure that it's going to be able to hold that weight. 
So what you're doing is you're standing under the foundation. And this is where we get the concept of the word understanding. In order to truly understand something, you need to stand under it and see what it's really based on before it all falls down on you and collapses. Again, I will ask the question, how important is it to know the truth about anything, especially about God? Because so many people in this country talk about worshiping God and having a, a, a relationship with the divine and have no concept of what the Bible actually teaches, of what the ancient Hebrews actually believed, what the ancient cultures taught, and consequently, what we have today is not a, we, we don't have a country of laws. We're told that Moses gave us the law, and so many people are following the Mosaic law. We don't have a nation of laws. No one has understanding. Nobody's tested the rope. People just believe whatever it is they've been told. And it never occurred to anyone to think about why is it that we can understand if someone's born in the middle of China that they wouldn't know about God or they wouldn't know about our understanding. They wouldn't know about the New Testament. What about someone born in the, in the wilds of Africa? They wouldn't understand our beliefs and our belief systems. Well, what makes you think that your belief system is any better than theirs? Again, one needs to do their homework on what we believe and where these beliefs have come from. I'm going to give you an example, and I've given this example here before. I think it's appropriate again. When we believe in our judicial system, all American law is collected in something called corpus juris secundum. Corpus juris secundum is a huge, voluminous set of American laws. And it's the bottom line on all of American law. Under the subheading in corpus juris secundum, under attorney and client, says this. An attorney has an obligation to the court and to the government no, no less significant than his obligation to his clients. Thus, an attorney occupies the dual position which imposes dual obligations. His first duty is to the court and to the government and not to his client. <clears throat> and whenever the duties of his client conflict with those he, owns, he owes as an officer of the court, the former must yield to the latter. So if you're in court and your attorney is doing something you don't like, it just don't matter. He's not working for you. He's an officer of the court. He works for the government. Now, under attorney and client, it goes on to say, a client is one who applies to an attorney or a lawyer for counsel or advice in the direction and a question of law. Therefore, if you hire an attorney, you are known as a client by law. It goes on to say that a clients are called wards of the court in regard to their relationship with their attorneys. So if you hire an attorney, you're a client. And if you're a client, you are referred to by law as a ward of the court, end quote. Block's Law Dictionary, under the heading of wards of the court, says, a ward of the court is an infant or a person of unsound mind. So if you hire an attorney by law, you're an idiot. <laughs> That's what the law says. Why? Because if you had any brains, which you don't, but if you did, you wouldn't even be in court. You wouldn't even have to go to court. Why do you play? Why do you have to go to court? You play tennis on a court. You play basketball on a court. Why do you play tennis? Uh, what do you play tennis on a court with? You play with a racket. This reason why is because everything is a racket. The whole thing is a racket. You think it's by chance that these words and terms are used? You better go back and do your homework. The people who run this country use terms and words and symbols and emblems, and they are telling you something all the time and you don't see it. Let me conclude this little <clears throat> beginning of this 
subject which I wish to deal with tonight, which is the root of all religions. But there was an interesting quote in the book called The New Totalitarians by Roland Humphrey. And in the book, The New Totalitarians, um, is a quote by Julian Huxley in the book called 1940, 1984. In the book 1984, Julian Huxley in England wrote the four, four words to 1984. And in the four words, Julian Huxley said this, quote, As political and economic freedom diminishes, sexual freedom tends compensatingly to increase. And the dictator, unless he needs cannon father or families with which to colonize empty or conquered territories, will do well to encourage that freedom, in conjunction with the freedom to daydream under the influence of narcotics, the movies, the radio. It will help to reconcile his subjects to the servitude which is now their fate. So what he's saying is that as your political and social and economic freedoms are diminishing, they're giving you plenty of sex, drugs, and rock and roll and entertainment to keep you occupied as they're planning your demise. Because the people of this country are hated by the most powerful bankers in the world, and America is the most hated country in the world because the men who founded this country went against the most powerful banking families in the world to establish this country and basically said to the Queen of England, you come over here, we'll whip your ass. And they did. The Americans, there was only a 2% of the male population in this country stood up against the British fleet and sent the British back home with their tails between their legs bleeding. And you've got to understand, young people will understand this. If you beat somebody up in the mob or in a gang war and you beat somebody up, you look like a big important guy. But it ain't over yet. They're coming back. You've just opened up a can of worms. Consequently, when the men that founded this country defeated the British in battle, they opened up a war against the most powerful banking families in the world, and it's not over yet. They're coming back, and they're going to do a number on this country to teach Americans, don't you ever, ever again talk about being free. America being the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're not free or brave. We're slaves in our own country. One of the most recent and most important reasons why we are slaves is because we're ignorant. Thomas Jefferson said, no country and no people can remain free and ignorant at the same time. Nobody's going to be free or ignorant. You can either be ignorant and stupid or you can be free. You can't be both. Which brings me to my subject, the root of all religions. I, am, I find it to be amazing that so many people in this country give lip service to God. They talk about God. They talk about the presence of the Almighty and have no concept in the world where the word God comes from. Have no concept in the world where the theological ideas and concepts have come from in the Western civilization. God is simply the word dog spelled backwards. This is why our churches have dogma. You need to understand that God, the root word for God coming out of Europe, is goth in German, G-O-T-H, which gives us gothic cathedrals, gothic ar architecture. That's German for God. In Scandinavia, the word is not goth, it's gut, G-U-T. So when you say, I've got a gut feeling, it's like God's telling me something. It's gut is Scandinavian for God. You go back to the word God. As I said, God is dog spelled backwards. Why? Because in the ancient Egyptian religion, 
the most powerful divine being in all of Egypt was Osiris. And Osiris said that the gods who came from the star system of Osiris, 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 or the star system of Sirius, came to this earth. This was the, the teachings of the ancient Egyptians, that the gods, aliens if you please, came from another world called Sirius, and they came here and set up a divine arrangement in Egypt. And this is where we get the word sir. Yes, sir. comes from Sirius, Osiris. And today we know that Sirius is called the dog star. So <clears throat> when you begin to look at the movies, television, research these subjects, for many years you begin to see how words and terms and symbols are being used uh, to manipulate our thinking. And again I ask, how important is it really to know the truth? Uh, <clears throat> in Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, no, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, he is in his classroom at the beginning of the movie. And he is saying to his class that if you are looking for the truth, you are in the wrong room. That's down the hall and to the left. That's the religion philosophy department. He said, I am an archaeologist. I'm looking for facts, not truth. Because what's true to one person may not be true to another. So only if truth is founded on facts can you begin to build a life. And again, if you're hanging by the belief in something which is untrue, somewhere along the line is going to bring you trouble. So when you understand that there is a, an ancient lineage of theology and religion that connects to government, because in the ancient world, kings and rulers will always occupy two different positions at the same time. Ancient kings were always, of course, the head of the kingdom, but they also were the communication with the gods. So consequently, whatever the king did, he had a divine right because he was in with the gods. We still have such things today. We still have such people today who think that they have a God-given right to rule over the human family. Somewhere along the line, I believe, there's going to come a time when the divine presence in the universe that we call God is going to show itself. And when it does, it's not going to be like anything you've ever anticipated. It is my belief that <clears throat> we have not even come to know God. We have not even come, to, come near to understanding the implications of what is in the Bible. Let me say at this point that I am not an atheist. I'm not even a humanist, though I respect both groups. The thing I respected about Steve Allen, Steve Allen was a good friend of mine. We did a lot of projects together, television and radio together. But when we were speaking before audiences, Steve Allen is a, <clears throat> or was a humanist. And... Of course, his stature was far better than mine before an audience. But I always appreciated Steve Allen when he would say to the audience that Jordan and I have different views on some subjects. But just because I have a different view with him does not mean he's wrong and I'm right. That's not what it means at all. It just means we have a different view. And that perhaps I'm wrong and maybe he's right. That struck me as very being a very big man to be able to say that because in point of fact that's true. I don't think anyone has the whole truth on anything. And I think that we learn every day from people and the Bible says we learn it from children. Even a child would lead us. Children will tell you some of the most off the wall things about you that are right on target. And they're not, they're not playing. They mean what they're saying. <coughs> Uh, so many people today in this country go to church and have no idea in the world where the word church comes from. The word church is an English word 
that is based on a Scottish word, Kirk. This is why in uh, Star Trek you have Captain Kirk and the good ship Enterprise. Enterprise, Kirk, church. This is why so many churches are divided into denominations like 10s and 20s and 50s. These words, are, they mean something. Kirk is Scottish for the English word church. But Kirk goes back to a Roman word, Circe. C-E-R-E-S, Circe. Circe was the name of a Roman goddess. She was called Mother Circe. Mother Circe could be traced back to a more ancient goddess in the Greek mythologies uh, named Circe. Mother Circe in Greece became Mother Circe in Rome, became Mother Kirk in Scottish, became Mother Church in English. Mother Circe in Greek, go back and do some reading on Greek mythology, you will find that Circe, Mother Circe, was able to hypnotize people and bring them into her home and hypnotize them and turn them into pigs and animals and then eat them. She would live off of them. This is precisely what Mother Church was designed to do some 1600 years ago by Constantine, Emperor of Rome. In the city of Nicaea, France, Emperor Constantine called together all of the magic practicing priests of the Roman Empire because the empire was in trouble like America is today. America's falling apart. America's in decline. America is collapsing. And I am of the opinion that America is collapsing because it's God's will that this nation collapse. Because it has accepted lies and deception and promoted all the teachings that are just not true. And somewhere along the line, that divine one in heaven couldn't possibly care less about what we think or how we view anything. It has its own agenda. As one minister I had respect for many years ago said, if God's going to do something, you can't stop him. If he's not going to do it, you can't make him. So since you can't influence anything, you ought to just shut up and sit down. And that's exactly what the scripture says. Be still and quiet and know that I am God. The idea being is that we don't have control over anything. The President of the United States has no control over anything. Governments have no control. But as long as they can make you think they're in control, then you will do their bidding. The most important thing you need to understand about your life is that God gave you your life to be free, not to crawl on your knees to any government, not to bend your knee to any man or any group of men, no church, no religion, no synagogue. You need to do your homework and find out where all this stuff really comes from. Moses. Moses was the leader of the moon, or the moon cult. How many Jews know that? That Moses was the leader of a moon cult? The children of Israel worshipped the moon at the time of Moses. Moon cult, the lunar god. This is why all today, all celebrations in the holidays in Judaism was celebrated after sundown. Do you know why all the celebrations in Judaism are celebrated after sundown? Hmm? It's because they were worshipping the moon, and that's when the moon comes out, is after sundown. When you begin to see how the stories of uh, Moses giving us the law, the Ten Commandments, Go back and read the Ten Commandments. You'll find out, first of all, there's two different renditions of the Ten Commandments in Genesis. One says one thing, one says the other. But the Ten Commandments of Moses is based on an Egyptian story called the Twelve Negative Confessions. The Twelve Negative Confessions were borrowed from the Law of Hammurabi. 
And the law of Hammurabi goes back to the most ancient laws that this world has ever known, in the Assyrian Hammurabi king. So there's a lot going on here. I said to the, some of the young people a while back before I started this, that Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, what are you talking about, a Last Crusade? I... I never met Steven Spielberg personally, but I am convinced that Steven is many things, but stupid isn't one of them. He doesn't make movies that are based on absolute total fiction. This guy is around in, in the company of brilliant people. Hollywood is turning out some impressive material. You need to do your homework and look at these stories that are coming out. In the what we would refer to, and I'll get back to Steven Spielberg, I have a reason for bringing that up. In what we would call the white man system, which is a Druidic, Northern European, religio-political, economic system, for a thousand years before the Roman Empire, Western Europe, Scandinavia, Britain, was what we might call the white establishment on the earth. And one of the most important priesthoods in that ancient establishment were the Druids. And the Druids had a very important symbol that they used that we still have today. It was a magic wand. Many of the Druid priests used magic wands, like Merlin the magician with his magic wand. Magic wands were always made out of the wood of a holly tree. It was made out of hollywood. And they're still working their magic on us in Hollywood today. This is where the word comes from. So I am of the opinion that unless and until we are prepared to look at the actual factual foundations of where our belief systems have come from, we're never, we're never going to be able to honor the God that we give lip service to. I am still totally convinced in my own mind, that there is a divine presence in the universe that men have called God. I have no problem with that idea at all. I'm totally convinced that this is an absolute fact, that there is some sort of a divine, quote, matrix, end quote. Incidentally, I produced a television show called Matrix back in 1989. Nobody ever gave me anything for the new movie, but... Uh, Going back to the fact that I believe that there is a God. I believe that there is a divine presence in the universe. But I'm also well aware that that presence has been misrepresented for many reasons, usually for ignorance alone. And this is why I wanted to talk a little bit this evening about the religion that we hold holy and where it came from. Keep in mind that all of the religious teachings of the, of the Western world and our Western civilization, all of the religious concepts and ideas that we hold dear have developed in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Western world, we have no religious concepts of beliefs that originated in the Southern Hemisphere. They all started in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's important. As far back as we can go into ancient history, and I've spent 43 years looking at ancient history with an eye, a particular eye, to theology and politics. As far back as, well, the point being is that the more we change, the more we stay the same. We're still believing the same things and teaching the same things that were taught some 6,000 years ago. We just don't know it. It's like Hollywood bringing out a movie that has been made six times and everybody thinks it's so, so great, except the old guys have seen the, so, the same show has been done five times. Right? It's the new guys, the kids, they think it's great. Well, the same thing is true with our belief systems and the things that we hold dear. There's nothing new under the sun. And I hope that I can show you some of that tonight. Put yourself back some 6,000 years ago when we don't have indoor plumbing, we don't have heat, um, 
mankind living on the great deserts of the world from the Serengeti in Africa to the Fertile Crescent in uh, Iraq and Iran 6,000 years ago the ancient world and probably far further than that but let's just go back 6,000 years the world was a very hostile place to live in for humans it got very cold at night and the animals, the predator animals, came out at night looking to get something to eat, something that was warm-blooded. So the idea is, is that if you didn't protect yourself when the sun was up, when the sun goes down, it's going to get cold. And you better have something to protect yourself. So the very first, in, in the researching of theology and religion of the ancient world, it becomes obvious that the first most ancient belief system in the world was that the greatest enemy that this human family, that we as humans have ever faced on this earth, the greatest enemy that we have ever faced, the ancient people said, was darkness. It gets cold and scary at night on the desert 6,000 years ago. So darkness was the first great enemy of the human family. Consequently, the sun <clears throat> was the greatest gift that the creator could possibly give the people of the earth, was the sun. The sun, of course, was the giver of life. And so many people have said that the ancient peoples were sun worshippers. In point of fact, that's not true. There's never been a people in the world that were sun worshippers. That's a mistranslation. In point of fact, the sun has been used as a symbol of mankind's concept of deity. The ideas that we hold about God, the sun symbolically represents. And the sun is not ours, of course. It doesn't belong to Africa. It doesn't belong to China, doesn't belong to us, it belongs to God. So it was God's son, and he was the light of the world. And so the sun is the light of the world. And if you go out at night and you look up at the stars, what are you looking into? You're looking into the sky. What's another word for the sky? Well, you're looking into heaven. That's right. So where is God's son? Well, he's up there in heaven. Yeah, that's where he is, up there in heaven. Where else would the son be if it isn't in heaven? He's the light of the world. Well, of course, what else lights the world if it isn't the sun? He is, uh, he is referred to in the ancient Egyptian religion, the son was referred to as our risen savior. Because in the morning, the sun would rise and the Egyptians felt that the sun was their savior. And in point of fact, the sun is your savior. You don't think so? Wait till it don't come up. The sun keeps us alive. So it was our risen savior. The Egyptians, the Egyptians and the ancient peoples of the world realized that the sun was giving off energy. And energy is translated into plants, we take in the energy for life. So energy is life. Without energy, we're dead. So consequently, we're like a battery. Without the energy, we're just dead. So without the energy from the sun, feeding the plants and animals of which we eat to get energy, the idea was developed in Egypt that God's sun, the light of the world, who is our risen savior, is giving us energy to live. So he is sharing his life. He's giving his life that you might live. So consequently the son, if it didn't give its life, we would be dead. So God's son is giving his life so that you might live. As I said, he was called the risen savior. The name of the son, the son was, had different names, <clears throat> different times in history of the Egyptian empire. When the sun came up in the morning, he was known as the newborn sun. <clears throat> His name was Horus. 
H-O-R-U-S. And Horus was our risen savior. <clears throat> he, was our, he was the risen one, Horus. Today, we still say that the sun comes up on the Horus rising. This is where we get the word horizon. It's Horus rising. <clears throat> so God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's right. There's only one son. <clears throat> and without it, we're dead. And it gives us everlasting life. The Egyptians said that when the sun came up, everything was peaceful. Man was in control again. But when it went down, we're not in control. The animals are. It's cold and it's scary out there in the dark. So God's son was called the Prince of Peace <clears throat> in the daytime. Incidentally, when the sun came up in the morning, it was called Horus. It walked across the sky, the Egyptians said, in 12 steps. This is where alcoholics get the 12-step program. This is where kids get the 12-step program. You start in the first grade and you end in the 12th. It's a 12-step program. <clears throat> and you, so consequently, the 12-step program goes back to Horus. Because Horus walked across the sky in 12 steps. In the morning, he was Horus of the first step. Later, he was Horus of the second step. And he walked across the sky in 12 steps. Today, we take the word Horus, H-O-R-U-S, H-O-R-U-S, and we turn it around and make it H-O-U-R-S, 12 hours. 12 hours is simply turning the U and the R around in Horus. So 12 hours of the 12 Horuses. <clears throat> the sun walks across the sky in 12 steps. The sun brought light into the world. Consequently, in Latin, the word light is Lucius. This is where we get Luke Skywalker, who does battle with Darth Vader. Wake up, get a life, and understand Hollywood symbolism. Darth Vader is Prince of Darkness. But in Egypt, the Prince of Darkness was called Set. They noticed that he came out to rule the world at sunset. So Luke Skywalker is merely the son, Lucius, Luke, Lucius. <clears throat> the evil that ruled over the night was, I said, ruled over by the prince of darkness. So you take evil and put a D in front of it and it becomes devil. Devil is simply the word evil with a D in front of it. The root word for God goes back to, as I said, the German word, <clears throat> which gives us our word good. So you take one of the O's out of good and it becomes God. God is good. Devil is evil. Church dogma. So consequently, the bottom line at the very beginning of the world was the war between light and darkness. The basis for all religion on the face of the earth is quite simply the war between daylight and dark. Now, follow me. This is why cop cars are black and white. Black of the, the black of the night, the white of the day. Understand that the most ancient concept in the world of God was the battle between light and darkness. The sun is able to say of itself that I am the light and the truth. I am the truth and the light, and no man comes to the Father unless he come through me. If you go back to the old Hebrew reference words, you will begin to see that when the Bible talks about, and let me, let me, let me stop here and add this in first, that when I talk about Jesus in the New Testament, From as far as I, as I can understand, and I've only been looking at this for 43 years, that Jesus is a metaphor. Jesus is a metaphor, a symbolic metaphor. It's symbolizing something when you talk about Jesus. One of the names in the ancient Greek for Horus was Iosis. In Greek, Horus was Iosis. 
I-E-S-U-S. You can interchange I's and J's. So you can interchange iosis with jesus or J-E-S-U-S, Jesus. Jesus, according to the reference works for thousands of years, is the Son. This is why we worship Christ or Jesus on Sunday. The Prince of Darkness, as I said, his name was Set. So God's Son walked across the sky in 12 steps. And he left the world. And when he left the world, he left the world in the hands of the prince of darkness. But he said he would come again. And he does every morning about 5.45, 5.30. And we're told that when he left, that those who saw when he left were told that just as you have seen him leave on a cloud, he will come back on a cloud. And that's true. Check it out every night and see if there isn't a cloud out there when the sun leaves and most likely there will be a cloud in the sky when he comes back so when you understand that the stories in the Bible in the New Testament the entire New Testament is a metaphor the entire New Testament is trying desperately to tell you something it is a metaphor a metaphor let me give you an example of a metaphor A metaphor is like Aesop's Fables. Aesop's Fables is a children's book that you read these little stories to the children and they teach a child certain principles and concepts and ideas that you couldn't ordinarily teach them. But teach them as an example and a little story and then they get it. Because after all, there's only two kinds of people in the world, those who get it and those who don't. And most people don't get it. And so we have a story in Aesop's fable of a race between the tortoise and the hare. If you will probably remember that as a kid. Where the tortoise is going to race the uh, rabbit. And the rabbit is obviously so fast that he takes off and he gets right up to the finish line within a few moments. And is so proud of how fast he is, he just sits down to take a nap and wait till this other turkey catches up, right? And the tortoise is just plugging along, and so he plugs along until he gets caught up with the rabbit, and then he crosses the goal line quietly, and then the rabbit wakes up to discover that he's lost the race. Why? Because you were arrogant. You were smart aleck and arrogant and thought you had it all made, and the tortoise won the race. So this is a story you tell the child, which teaches a child that just because you're good-looking, handsome, wealthy, intelligent, come from a good family, that doesn't mean you're going to win the race. Usually the poor working class guy who has a family, who raises his children, saves his money, buys a home, eventually one day he has a beautiful family, a lovely home, and a nice life. And the Elvis Presleys and the big movie stars are dead on drugs or shot themselves or something. So just because you are fast and clever and good, that doesn't mean you're going to win the race. So that teaches a child a concept. Well, this is what the New Testament is trying to teach you something. But the people who are presenting this New Testament to us are now arguing about what kind of a tortoise was it. Was it a desert tortoise or or an ocean-going tortoise? Or what kind of a rabbit was it? Where did this take place? And uh, where exactly was the goal line? And how fast was the rabbit actually able to run? And so they are sitting down with all of this uh, discussion back and forth and have missed the point. The point is, the story, the Bible is the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. Come on, my God, wake up. It's just a story. But the story is so profound in its implications when you understand it's a metaphor. It's trying to tell you something. And it has the teacher saying, it has Jesus saying, many will look with their eyes but not see, and listen with their ears but not hear, and with their heart not get the sense of it. We're not talking about an actual man who lived. We're not talking about an actual 
<clears throat> God who lived. We're not talking about, and there was no Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was no King Solomon or King David. They never existed. I used to talk with a rabbi who was the president of the American Rabbinical Association back in the mid-60s. He lived in Newton, Massachusetts, and he was the president of all American rabbis. And he and I used to sit for hours and talk. And I asked him once, Rabbi, tell me the truth. You're not talking to a fool now, you're talking to me. Tell me the truth. Was there a King Solomon and a King David? Was there an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And he says, look it, the Catholics have a religion. The Buddhists have got their, their thing. The Hindus have got their religion. The Jews have got their thing. You know, it's just a religion. It's just a, it's just a story. And so he explained to me, and I said, and it was interesting, I said, well then, are you saying that these, these stories are fictitious? He said, of course they're fictitious. It's a story. And then he explained to me that the, in the Hindu religion, we have Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the triune god, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. In Egypt, we have Osiris, Isis, Horus. In Christianity, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So in Judaism, we have to have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the triune God. Incidentally, Abraham was not called Abraham in the Bible. He was called Abram. Did you know that? Because most people don't. Abram was from the land of Chaldea. Did you know that? Abram was from the land of Chaldea. Do you know where Chaldea was? Chaldea is what we call today Iraq. So the great and holiest of all holy men to the Jew world Jewish religion is Abraham, who really wasn't Abraham at all. It was actually Abram, and he was an Iraqi. That's the history. And then when you find out Abram, A-B-R-A-M, as the rabbi, as rabbi, I was going to give his name, as the rabbi said to me, Abraham's first name was actually Abram, A-B-R-A-M, because in the ancient Hebrew, A-B-Ab is father. And Ram, R-A-M, is Aries, the Ram. The constellation of the Ram is Aries, the Ram. This is why when Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, and he sees the children of Israel uh, worshiping the golden calf. And he throws the law down and breaks the tablets. He was the first law. He broke the law. And consequently, he saw the children of Israel worshiping a golden calf. Why? Go back and look at this story and you begin to see that the golden calf was actually the sun in the age of Taurus, Taurus the bull. Taurus the bull was the golden calf. This is why in England they even have a university called Oxford. It goes back to the worship of the golden calf, Oxford. We'll go on with all of that later, but again, Jesus represents a metaphor. The word Jesus is a metaphor, a symbolic term for spiritual and intellectual enlightenment. Let me go back over that again for you. This is a very important point. Jesus, not a man, but Jesus is a metaphor for a, for a, it's a symbolic metaphor for spiritual and intellectual enlightenment as opposed to ignorance. So consequently, everything that the Bible has Jesus saying and doing is what intellectual, spiritual enlightenment would do and say in any given cir circumstances. Consequently, we're told that Jesus was arrested and um, they brought him into the temple and at nighttime and tried him and found him guilty of sedition and um, 
you go back and look at that story. First of all, if you're sound asleep and you've been very, very tired and you're right in the middle of a very sound sleep and someone slips into your bedroom and turns on a 600-watt bulb right next to your bed, it not only frightens you, but immediately you turn your head away. You don't want to, because it hurts your eyes. Why? Because the light is too brilliant. It's too bright and it hurts your eyes. Symbolically, that's what we're talking about in the Bible. When somebody who was spiritually enlightened, brilliant, so to speak, someone who is spiritually alive with intellectual and spiritual enlightenment, and he's trying to enlighten you, and you're listening to that one as he speaks, what you're doing is you are judging the spiritual and intellectual enlightenment to see what you decide about it, whether you think it's true or not. So what you're doing is you are, you are judging spiritual and intellectual enlightenment. Where? Up here in the temple. That's the part of your brain. In the temple you are trying the light of God's word. Intellectual, spiritual enlightenment in the temple. Consequently, when you decide after hearing someone who is trying to enlighten you spiritually, you've decided that this guy is full of bull and you don't want to hear him anymore. You've heard enough of this. What you have just done is you now have put to death. You have condemned him to death, to die. You have condemned spiritual and intellectual enlightenment to die. Where? Well, where did Jesus, where was it said that Jesus died? In Golgotha, skull place, the place of the skull. You put intellectual, spiritual enlightenment on trial in the temple. And when you decide you don't want to hear any more spiritual enlightenment or intelligence, then you decide to condemn that spiritual enlightenment to death. Where? In Golgotha, skull place, in your head. So the whole story of the New Testament is the war between spiritual and intellectual intelligence as opposed to a world of darkness, ignorance, ill-informed ignorance. And of course, spiritual and intellectual enlightenment always dies between two thieves, the regret for the past and fear of the future. That's always killed everything. Consequently, we're told that God's son dies with a crown of thorns. Crown of thorns, yes. The Statue of Liberty has a crown of thorns. A crown of thorns is nothing more than the sun rays. As the sun dies, you will see each evening the crown of thorns. This is why the Statue of Liberty has a crown of thorns. Statue of Liberty, the concept is liberty and freedom is based on spiritual and intellectual enlightenment. You're not going to be free if you're stupid. So consequently, the Statue of Liberty represents spiritual and intellectual enlightenment. But there's a whole story behind that we can go into another time. But the point being is that this crown of thorns are the light rays. We're told that 13 is an unlucky number. Why? Because it's based on Jesus and his chosen 12. Jesus and his chosen 12 make 13. This is why you have 12 jurors. Because the 12 jurors in the court supposedly are there to uh, bring, the, bring the truth to light with the light of truth. So you have 12 jurors, like you have 12 apostles, 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 tribes of Israel. Look in the Bible and see how many times you see 12. Because actually, the number 12 is based on the reason why Jesus had 12 apostles. is the same reason why there were 12 tribes in Israel. The 12 always represented the 12 houses of the Zodiac. Both the Old and New Testament is nothing more than astrology or astrotheology. This is why the Bible has Jesus saying the prayer 
that we are to pray to God, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You begin to look up the word kingdom and it is a root word for zodiac. So what the master teacher, the enlightened one, was telling us is that let thy kingdom, the zodiological, astrological complication of the heavens is the kingdom of God. And those 12 constellations direct the affairs of mankind on the earth. And for thousands of years before even the Roman Empire, the ancients traveled the seas of the world by the study of the stars. They navigated around the earth because they could look at the stars and travel around the world navigating by the stars. So what I'm saying is that you need to understand that the stars also influence you in your life. Most people have no concept of this. And this is why America is in trouble. We have a nation filled with people who are called Christians who do not understand anything about Christianity, the church, or where anything comes from. Think about the logic of what I'm going to tell you. That this is a country that is primarily in the hands of Christian people who pray to God every day for protection and to protect their family and for a good life and for peace and hope, etc. And the more Christians pray, the worse the world gets. The more violence, the more bloodshed, the more heinous acts of treason, and it's building and building and building. And the more we pray, the worse it gets. Logic alone should tell you you're doing something wrong. If it's not working, it's because we have offended that divine presence in the universe who put those, those 12 zodiological symbols in the heaven. And in the book of Job 38, 31, and 32, 33, look it up, Job 38, 31, 32 and 33, where God says to Job, where were you when I created the blessed Pleiades? When I created Orion, the belt of Orion. Where were you when I created Maseroth? Look up the word Maseroth. It will tell you. It's a Phoenician Canaanite word called Hebrew. It's a Hebrew Phoenician Canaanite word. Maseroth means zodiac. The Bible has God saying to Job, where were you when I created the zodiac? I put my signs in the heavens and you don't look. Many will look with their eyes, but you don't see. You're listening with your ears, but you're not hearing. And with the heart, you're not getting a sense of it. And so consequently, since we are offending the divine presence in the universe by calling down evil upon something that God has created, the divine presence in the universe is very fearful. It doesn't care if you're right or what you think or how you believe. Either you're right or you're wrong. And consequently, when we begin to understand that we have been led into condemning something that God has created, we are in serious trouble in this country because we are not, we are not being, we don't have leaders. We have misleaders. We have people who make tons of money on Christian television with their little homosexual hairdos and their diamond rings and all of their wristwatches dancing around singing praises to the Lord and never realize the very word Lord, L-O-R-D, comes from L-A-R-D, Lord. And why is L-A-R-D, Lord, is Greece. Greece is oil. Oil is Christos. And in the Greek language, Christos is where Pillsbury gets a cooking oil called Crisco. Crisco is Christo, and Christo 
is Christ. Oil, when it congeals, is called Lord, L-A-R-D. Wake up and get a life. This is an incredible world of deception, lies, misrepresentations. And as far as I'm concerned, until such time as we are able to, for the first time, actually understand what the Bible is telling us and where we're going, why do you think they have something in the Bible called the book of Revelation? Revelation is nothing more than the Zodiac. I could go on for hours showing you. I was not able to bring a uh, projector here so that I could show you the scriptures, the symbols, and the emblems. But remember that the entire New Testament is a metaphor, an astrological metaphor for the outworking of God's plan on the earth. And we as Christians and Jews have been taught that this is something evil. Why? Why does the church say that astrology is evil? Obviously, because they don't want you to know what they know. They're not stupid. They, they, they have been guided by the astrological symbols in the churches for a thousand years. Why do you think Jesus fed his followers with two fish? The two fish are Pisces. Why do you think the Pope wears the mitre? It's the symbol of the fish. The two fish are the fish of the two fish of uh, Pisces. Let me let me go back and and explain this to you. On the first day of summer, as I said, all of the religious teachings in our Western world come from the northern hemisphere. All right. If you go to the very first day of summer, directly overhead in our northern hemisphere, the first day of summer is the, the, the constellation that begins summer is called Leo. So consequently, the sun is called the Lion King. Disney makes movies about the Lion King, and Christians go to see the movie The Lion King and haven't got the faintest idea in the world what they're looking at. Disney also is many things, but stupid is not one of them. So the Lion King is the sun in the constellation of Leo the Lion the lion of the tribe of Judah. But consequently, three months later, he enters into something called autumn, or the fall. Why? Because he was standing straight, and now he's falling. So the first day of fall, he is halfway on his way to the southern hemisphere. Now understand, each day from the first day of summer, the lion king, it moves one degree southward every day, one small degree southward every day until it hits the three months, the 90 days, it hits the 90th degree, it is now passing over the equator and it's heading south. Three months later, 90 degrees more, and it finally ends up in the lowest part of the southern sky. For three days, once it reaches the lowest part, it's called the winter solstice. That's on December 22nd. The, the sun going southward reaches the lowest point in the southern sky on December 22nd. And, it, and the next day, December 23rd, it rises on that same degree. The following day on the 24th, rises on the same degree. So it hasn't gone any further south, and it hasn't started back north either. So for three days, the sun is dead in his tomb. On December 25th, each year, the sun moves one degree northward, which means it's now moving again. So therefore, it is born again. And we now are able to celebrate God's son's birthday on December 25th. It is born again. Why? It is now beginning its annual journey back to the northern hemisphere. And as it gets to that halfway point again, and this is important, as it gets to that halfway point again, we call it spring. Because he was dead in winter. He was the Lion King in summer. He's now fallen. 
Now he's completely dead in winter. Everything's dead in winter in the northern hemisphere. Now he's coming back, so he's springing back to life. And in the first week of spring, he crosses over the equator again, coming back to the northern hemisphere. So in the ancient world, they celebrated the first week of spring. And when in the ancient world, when you died, like the sun did in December, when you died in the ancient world, people would say, Grandmother passed last night. We still say the same thing today. Grandfather passed on last night. Uh, grandmother passed away, or they passed. The word passed always meant death. They have died. They passed last night. And so consequently, the Egyptians said that when you died, you passed over from the east of the Nile to the west of the Nile. You have passed over to the next world. So consequently, the son, which was the lion king of the tribe of Judah, he was really hot. And then in the fall, he's now falling. And now he dies in Capricorn. He dies in the winter. Then on December 25th, he moves one degree northward, so we celebrate that he's come back to life. He is now moving back into the northern hemisphere. He crosses the equator on the first week of spring. And the ancient peoples a thousand years before Hebrews ever existed celebrated the first week of spring and they called it the Passover. Okay? The Passover is the sun passing over the equator on its way back to the northern hemisphere. And once it reaches the northern hemisphere to pass over, it's in the constellation in the ancient zodiac of Virgo. So he is born of a virgin. Wake up. Get a life. This is why Christians are called believers, because they believe. They don't know anything. They believe. And I am saying that if there is a God, which I am totally convinced there is, that we had better wake up and start showing respect for the divine heavens and the story that is written in the divine heavens because there are some serious problems coming down on this earth and it's been foretold thousands of years ago by people who knew how to read the symbols. And consequently, when the first day of the first week of spring was called the Passover, because the sun, which was dead in winter, is now passing over into a new life in spring. But of course, Christians could not have anything to do with the Passover, because obviously that's Jewish, and we wouldn't want to have anything to do with that. So consequently, we say that God's son is resurrected. It doesn't matter if you call it resurrected, or passed over, or coming back to life, it's still the sun is passing over. It's resurrected. It's coming back. And consequently, as I said, first week in spring, according to the ancient Egyptian calendar, was in Virgo. So God's son is born of a virgin. So Christians go out on the first week of spring, and they have something called an Easter sunrise service. Sunrise service? Well, of course, God's son is risen. It's sun worship. Wake up, it's sun worship. It's the obvious happiness that the human family has in the northern hemisphere that God's son is coming back. And so in the first week of spring is the Passover and Christians go out early in the morning to greet the newborn son on Easter, which is Esther or Ishtar. It has to do with sun worship. It has to do with, with the most ancient story the world has ever known. This is why the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. The sun of God represents spiritual and intellectual enlightenment, the light of the world. When the sun comes up in the morning, it's the newborn sun. At 12 noon, it became known as the Most High. He is the most high. Why? Because it don't get much higher than noon. It's called high noon. So he is the most high. Yeah. 
then at night he dies. He goes to the underworld. So there's three different positions the son holds in the life of man. The newborn, the full-grown, and the old dying man. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The triune, the trinity, is nothing more than the son and the three phases in man's life. But it's only one son, but it's three divine persons. So they say, well, it's a mystery. Nothing's a mystery. You know, television's a mystery to a Uganda. You know, if you're out in the middle of Africa, it's not a mystery if you've got an education and can read and think a little bit. Nothing's a mystery. The only real mystery is how it is that we don't know these things when it's been written for thousands of years. I have said over and over that there's nothing holy in Salt Lake City, in Rome, in Mecca, and especially there's nothing holy in Jerusalem. The only thing that's holy in Jerusalem are the stories. They're full of holes. <laughs> and once you begin to see where these stories have come from, how they have developed, you begin to see that we have been misled. We're being misled every day by our government, by our courts, by men who call themselves the authorities. In my life, I have no authority but the God who created me. And I will not bend my knee to no man, to no government, at no time, under no conditions, ever, period. Because I am well aware that there is a divine presence in the universe that men have called God. It has written its, its agenda in the heavens. And for thousands of years, mankind, mankind has known that and respected that. Now let me show you something. On the sun, you draw a circle, and in it you put 360 little dots around the circle. 360 dots around a circle, or 360 degrees. And then you take the first degree, which is on a circle, pick a spot. So you pick this one, and you go straight across, and now you've divided the circle. Now take the 90 degrees over here, and go straight across, and now you've divided it again. Oh, thank you. This, this won't project, but at least we'll get it on tape. Okay. So now you have divided the um, circle four ways. This is why you have four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. Okay. <clears throat> the four Gospels are the four seasons. And Consequently, when you drive by a church, look on the churches, you will always see a cross and a circle. A circle on the cross. All churches have them. Why? Because the cross is the cross of the zodiac, north, south, east, and west. And the sun dies on the cross. The sun dies on the cross of the zodiac. That's a fact. This is why if you go to any church in this country, you will see on the cross a circle. The circle is the sun, God's sun, the light of the world. He is our savior. Of course the sun's your savior. As I said, if it don't come up, we're dead. So consequently, you need to appreciate that for Thousands of years, whoever created our universe, whoever this one is that we call God, whoever this divine presence is that we refer to as the Almighty, has outlined for us our destiny. And it's written in the stars. And consequently, we have been lied to and deceived 
into thinking that something is evil. And this is why in the book of Acts, when the apostle Peter is told by an angel to go into Macedonia, he is told to go over into Greece and bring this information, this knowledge to the Greek peoples. And Peter says to the angel in the book of, in the book of Acts, uh, I don't even eat with those people. We're Jews. We don't have anything to do with those Greeks. And it's interesting. The angel said, you stop calling down evil upon something God has cleansed. We didn't ask you to go. We told you to go. I would, I would respectfully suggest this exactly the way we ought to view this. <clears throat> that <clears throat> we should stop calling down evil upon something God created. We should stop calling down evil upon something which the Almighty God has put into the heavens as a story for us to understand where we are going and what's going to come on the inhabited earth. Because I'm telling you that there are some very serious things beginning to come into focus and things are going to start happening very soon and if you understood astral theology and understood the symbols in the zodiac you would begin to see what's coming why did Judas go out and kiss Jesus do you recall that in the Bible Jesus went out, when Jesus was going to be arrested Judas went out and kissed him what are we talking about a grown man going out and kissing another one why the Christians will tell you that, Jesus, that Judas went out and kissed Jesus to identify him. Logic alone, if you just use a little intelligence, would tell you that's, that's absolutely outrageous. Nothing could be further from the truth. The little town in which Jesus would have been was not Chicago's south side. You know, it's just a little Mickey Mouse, little establishment out in the desert. And there's only two or three hundred people living in that little village. And a man that supposedly is raise, uh, healing the sick and raising the dead so that even Caesar in Rome knows about him. You mean that somebody's got to tell me where he is and, and identify him? What are you kidding? Identify? There's only 600 people in the whole county, right? Everybody knows who he is. Everybody knows where he is. So what do you need somebody to go out and kiss him in public? Well... You see, that's another case of where Christians have misunderstood. It doesn't say in the scriptures that Judas went out to kiss Jesus to identify him. It says he went out to kiss Jesus to betray him, not identify. Why? Simple. <clears throat> According to all the Christian reference works, go to any good a seminary library and get the Christian reference books and spend about 20 years. It'll finally dawn on you what's going on. Judas represents the first month of fall. The first month of fall because the Lion King was strong and hot but he has now fallen. What made him fall into autumn? The first week of fall is the constellation of Scorpio. Scorpio is the backbiter. So consequently, in the ancient world, unlike scorpions here today in America, scorpions in the ancient world and in the Middle East have two stingers, one on top of the other. And when they sting you, the cut that they make on your skin looks just like human lips. So the ancient people said, when you got stung by a scorpion in the Middle East, you just got the kiss of death. You are, you are going to die. And how do, how do they know? Because the cut looks like two lips. You got the kiss of death. This is where the mafia and Corsica and Malta got the concept of the kiss of death. They kiss you when they're going to kill you. The symbol goes back to the scorpion. It's deadly, and they're going to kill you. You're going to die, and they kiss you goodbye. So consequently, Scorpio gave God's son the kiss of death, and now he's going to fall into winter and die. That's why the story 
of Judas kissing Jesus. Judas represents Scorpio. In the first week of spring, when the sun comes back to the northern hemisphere, the Jews call it the Passover. Christians call it Easter. But in the ancient world of what today we refer to today as Israel and, and Lebanon, in that area today we call it Israel and Lebanon, thousands of years ago was called Cana. Have you ever heard that name, the land of Cana? Incidentally, Cana in the Phoenician language means merchant banker. I don't know what that tells you. In the land of Cana, and this is important, so try and follow this. The land of Cana celebrated Easter, Passover, whatever you want to call it. But they didn't call it Easter or Passover. They called it the marriage feast. They call it the marriage feast of Cana. This was a celebration of spring. Why? The marriage feast of Cana was quite simply the marriage between God the Father and Mother Earth, Mother Nature. God the Father was going to impregnate Mother Earth, Mother Nature, with his sacred fluid, which brought life to the world. That fluid in the ancient Hindu was called rain, R-A-I-N. Rain in the ancient Hindu religion was called the sacred fluid which brought life into the world. And so consequently the ancient Phoenician Canaanites, who we today call the ancient Israelites, celebrated something called the marriage feast of Cana. The marriage feast of Cana was quite simply the marriage between God the Father and Mother Nature, Mother Earth. And consequently, in order to have some sexual union between God the Father and impregnating Mother Nature, you had to have a wedding. So it was called the Wedding Feast of Cana. And the concept of the Wedding Feast of Cana was very simple. God's son was asked by Mother, his Mother Nature, Mother Earth, asked God's son to draw water. Well, that's what the sun does. It draws water. And so it can rain on the grapes. And you can smash the grapes and make wine. So God's son draws the water to change water into wine at the great marriage feast of Cana. The sun draws the water. It rains on the grapes. They smash the grapes and they make wine. God's son has changed water into wine. All of these Concepts and ideas, as I said, we're told that Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Another mistranslation. That's not what it says in the original. When we hear that Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, no. <clears throat> the heavens were, to the Phoenician Canaanites, the heavens were referred to as the temple of God. The heavens declare the temple of God. This is where God exists, is in the heavens. So consequently, in the New Testament, it is a mistranslation to say, in my Father's house are many mansions. That doesn't make any sense to anyone. Read correctly, in the Greek, what Jesus was saying, and what intellectual, spiritual enlightenment was saying, in my Father's abode are many houses, not in my father's house are many mansions, but in my father's abode are many houses. Yeah, like 12 houses of the Zodiac. And on the Last Supper, Jesus at the Last Supper, the Last Supper is, of course, the last Passover meal. Because every spring they would celebrate the coming of the sun in Virgo with a Passover meal because the sun has passed over. Well, the idea is that in the last Passover would be the last year in the particular sign, and the next year would begin a new sign. And as I said at the beginning, Moses was, um, comes down from the mountain, he sees the children of Israel 
worshipping the golden calf. The golden calf, again, was the sun in the age of Taurus. And Moses comes down to bring the new law, a new beginning, a whole new religion. Now this time, Moses is bringing the new religion, which is going to be the age of Aries, the ram. And so consequently, the Jews today still blow the shofar, or the ram's horn. They blow the shofar, which is celebrating the sun in the age of the ram. Their father, Abram. Abraham, Ab Ram, the, the, the shofar. My father's house have many mansions. No. Why do you have to get baptized? Well, you can, if you're going to be born again, you have to get baptized. Why? Because when you were born, you came out of your mother's water. Her water broke. And you came out to life. So if you're going to, uh, be, bapt if you're going to be born again, then you have to go out into a lake, into mother's water, mother nature, mother earth's water, and be submerged and come out, and now you're coming out of your mother's water, and you're going to be baptized and born again. We could go on and on. We're living in the last days, in the end times. Yes, we're living in the last days, in the end times. Of what? We're living in the last days of the age of Pisces. Pisces is a symbol of the two fish. This is why Jesus is called the great fisherman. The two fish. What's coming? What is the next age we're going into? Well, go to Luke in the Bible, in the New Testament. Luke 22.10. Luke 22.10, the apostles asked, his 12 followers ask Jesus, where are we to go now that you're leaving this world? Where are we to go? And he says in the book of Luke 22.10, go into the house, go into the city, and you will see a man carrying a pitcher of water. Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. The man with the water pitcher, the house of the man with the water pitcher, is this the house of Aquarius? Because that's a symbol of Aquarius as a man carrying a pitcher of water. Go to any good Christian Jewish reference work in the world and all reference works will tell you that in the ancient world no man ever carried water. Ever. That was unheard of in the ancient world. Men don't carry water. Women would go to the well. Women would get the water. Never would a man go to get water. It was unheard of. That was a woman's job. She goes to the well. Well, then why would Jesus say to his apostles, go into the city and you will see a man with a water pitcher. Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. The story is an astrological story saying that the last Passover, the last supper, is in the age of Pisces, the two fish. And now we're going to go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. The next 2,000 year period coming which is called the kingdom of God, that we're all praying for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I have news for you. The kingdom is going to come like it is in heaven on earth, whether you like it or not. And whether you understand it or not, it just don't matter. It's coming anyway. The world events are fastly coming to a place where we're going to discover that we've been lied to and deceived by the religions and the governments of the world. And so I'm saying that I feel it is a time that we should now begin to reflect on what it is we believe, why we believe it, and remembering that the scripture says many will look with their eyes but not see. Listen with their ears, but not hear, and with the heart, not get the sense of it. We are going into some very perilous times, and it's, a tie, it's an idea whose time has come to wake up and do your homework. And I want to thank you for listening to me. Uh, do you want to take a few questions, maybe? If you have any. 
Just because you're asking questions does not necessarily mean I have the answer. I see my friend Anthony Holdos here. That's my friend Anthony Holder. Yeah. Anyway, is there, are, is there anyone has any questions on this? And I'll entertain a few questions. Oh, wait, if you could come into mic, actually. What comment do you have on the healing and the uh, res resurrection of the dead on that part? Say it again. In the healing and the resurrection of the dead in the Bible. Uh, what, yeah. do you, what is it uh, that you're saying about that then? Well, first of all, the scriptures actually says that when Jesus was resurrected, that there were many people who came out of the grave with him and walked along the streets. Are you aware of that? It says many people were resurrected with him and walked on the streets. Um, I have had so many people say, well, God is with me because I prayed to God when my child was sick or whatever and he was, when he was healed, or this person was in this terrible accident and we prayed to God and they were healed or whatever. But what most people don't stop and think about is that all over the world and every nation, people who are honestly seeking divine guidance and help from the spirit and the universe that spirit reciprocates. It, it, you know, the uh, Hindus have done the same thing. They prayed for someone to be healed, and they were healed. In Africa, there were the African uh, priests will pray for someone who's been harmed or hurt or something, and they are healed. How did that happen? Well, in their language, they would tell you, well, their God, their spirit, protected and healed this individual. Well, the Hindus will tell you the same thing. In China, they have the priest who will heal and pray over you, and it will heal you. And you say, well, how is it that all of these people will pray to, pray to their gods, and, 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 and it works? It's because there is no personal God. There is a presence in the universe that operates through us, so that if you sincerely are asking the Spirit to help you, it doesn't matter what color, race, creed, or color, or where you're from. That divine presence in the universe that men has called God operates through all of us. So it doesn't matter if you're in China or if you're in Africa or if you're in America. It just doesn't matter. That God is the God of all mankind. It operates through all of us. God is far too big for one religion. So consequently, when I use the term God, I'm not talking about the Jewish God or the Hebrew God or the Christian God. I'm talking about the divine presence that holds the whole universe together. And it has an agenda. And it responds to human life on the earth. So that if you are praying for something to happen, are praying for someone to be healed, and it happens, it's, because, it's not because of your particular con concept of God. It's because there is some kind of a matrix going on in the universe. Okay, no, now the healing uh, or, the, or the resurrection or, or the bring it back to life. Is right. uh, you were talking about uh, Jesus uh, being not a, a, a person or, but, a, but a symbol. Uh, but a symbol. Of right? intellectual enlightenment. Right. Uh, okay. And how is it that uh, it's saying in the Bible that he resurrected the dead and also that he uh, made, you know, people walk and uh, so forth, m let people see yeah. and all this? Yeah. This is what the spirit of intellectual spiritual enlightenment accomplishes. The spirit of intellectual, spiritual, and intellectual enlightenment does help people to see things. You know, the, you know, people say, oh, I see what you mean. Oh, I see. Now, it doesn't mean you were blind. It just means now it's opened up your eyes to understand a particular concept you didn't know before. So consequently, God's Son has now uh, given, you know, 
healed you from your blindness so that now you see. And before, you didn't know what to say. You don't know how to answer anybody. But now you have the answer. So now he has taught you to speak when you were, when you were dumb. So the whole concept of the Son giving you life, resurrection... The resurrection also can go all the way back to uh, reincarnation. Yeah, but you're saying, uh, you're, you're, you're starting saying that he's not a person. Yeah. You're saying that uh, basically he's just, a like metaphor. you're saying, the all, the light. Yeah. The, uh, Intellectual, <clears throat> spiritual enlightenment. Right. And if the Bible says that he's walking on the land, okay... You know, the okay. Bible also said he walked on water, and it does. Right. You go out at, 10, at 6 o'clock in the evening, watch the sun go down on the Pacific, it walks on water. So the sun walks on water. You know. True. But then again, also, <laughs> if he is the son of the Almighty, he could do many things, you know what I'm saying? Well, he does. That's true. He brings life into the world. He heats up the world. He's the essence of the, of the Father. The Bible says that when you see God's Son, you've seen the Father. Why? Because the Son represents all of the qualities that we associate with God. First of all, He's our protector. He's our enlightener. He enlightens us. He feeds us and gives us life, which is energy. He brings warmth into our life. Uh, you know, he, he does all these wonderful things for us. So you're saying He can't be a man? Now, I'm not saying he can't be a man. I'm just saying that the story itself is called astrotheology right. and has been told by 15 other major cultures in the world before Christianity. There are 15 cultures in the world that have had... Let me, let me show you something. Uh, in Rome, <clears throat> in, uh, from about the 3rd century B.C. to 1 A.D., that 300-year period before Jesus would have been born, uh, that year that Jesus would have been born would have been 1 A.D. But for 300 years before Jesus would have been born, in the Roman Empire, there was a religion that dominated the Roman Empire. It was called Mithraism. Go to the encyclopedia and look up Mithra. Mithraism was the religion of the Roman Empire until Christianity. And in Mithraism, Mithra was called the God's son, the light of the world. He had 12 helpers or 12 followers. His mother was a virgin. He died on the cross for men's sins. His father was a carpenter. He, uh, he, he raised the sick and uh, he healed the sick and raised the dead. Uh, they celebrated his birthday. Mithraism celebrates the birthday of God's son on December 25th. They celebrated his, uh, his coming back to life on the first week of spring. The entire Christian story was already in Rome for 300 years before Jesus would have been born. It was called Mithraism. But that's not the only place. You can go back to the Hindus. You can go back to Egypt and the sun worship there. The same identical thing. Horus was born of a virgin. His father was a carpenter. He ultimately died for the mankind. So I'm just saying there were 15 other major uh, civilizations in the world that had the identical same story. Right, but th uh, then again, okay, there's a small, there's a lap, there's a lapse between, um, like the age that he was, uh, oh, 18 that's the, or something, to the age of yeah, 32. Yeah, that's a very interesting. Okay, yeah, that he was missing. Yeah. Okay. Now yeah, that's called gone, the missing years right, of Jesus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now he and the rabbis gone. will tell you. The rabbis, when you talk to them, they will tell okay. you. Yeah. He could have been going around the, uh, the world at that point, okay? Of course. Now, okay, another thing is that I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. Without a, any doubt whatsoever, uh, with giving, I mean, any, any kind of doubt, you're absolutely positive that there was no um, Jesus Christ. That oh, no, no, I never said that. No, that's what I'm no, saying. No, no, yeah, no, let me answer that. Okay, yeah. that's a good question. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm not saying there was no man named Jesus, because oh. I wasn't there. That's about okay. 2,000 years ago, and I wasn't there. No, I All thought you were saying, I thought uh, you yeah. were saying that it, it was the sun, I mean, the actual sun up in the sky, and there was no... What no. I, all right, let me, let me clarify my position on this. Okay. First of all, I'm not an atheist, as I said before. Uh, I have the highest of respect for an admiration for spirit things, spiritual things. 
I believe myself to be a spiritual man because I, I live every day studying spiritual subjects because I love the spirit. Um, however, I am not saying that Jesus as a man did not exist because I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. It'd be ludicrous to say anything like that. What I am saying is that the story, whether the man actually lived or not, is in point of fact irrelevant to the story. What is relevant is that the story of the New Testament is trying to tell you something, is trying to educate you, is trying to tell you that the bottom line in religion is the same as it has always been. There's nothing new under the sun. The bottom line on the, on the Bible is quite simply the war between intellectual, spiritual enlightenment and human darkness and ignorance. That's the war that's going on. So I'm saying that there were 16, including Christianity, 16 major cultures of the world had the same identical story, which is called astrotheology, with all of those little stories you know, that I went through. Now, whether there was an actual man named Jesus or not, I don't know. I wasn't there. But what I do know from 43 years of studying this one subject is that, the, that there were 15 other cultures that had the same identical story. Now, let me throw this in real quick. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1948, in 1947, one year before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, there was another set of scrolls found that very few people know about. They're called the Naj Hammadi, N-A-G, Naj Hammadi Manuscripts. The Naj Hammadi Manuscripts were found in Egypt in a little town called Naj Mahadi. And today there are huge reference books in the big bookstores. Go in there and they ask for the books on the Naj Mahadi Manuscripts. And you will find that one year before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and the Qumran community, which is up in what we call the Holy Land, and Egypt, in a little town called Najmahadi, a huge group of manuscripts were found. And in those manuscripts, they know by the writings and by all the uh, surrounding evidence that those Najmahadi manuscripts were at least 200 years before Jesus would have been born. And it was in Egypt, not the Holy Land. And the Naj Mahadi manuscripts, 200 years before Jesus would have been born, talks about Jesus. He walked the earth, he did this, he, he uh, healed the sick, he raised the dead, he was this, he was that. And it has all these strange stories about Jesus as a child. And it says, while the children were playing in the street and the birds were flying, Jesus uh, cursed the birds and they all fell down. And then all the children cried. And they said, oh, okay, all right. So he blessed the birds and then they all got up and flew away again. And there's all kinds of stories about Jesus did this and Jesus said that and Jesus went over here and did this and that. We're talking about in Egypt, Naj Mahadi, 200 years before Jesus and the Bible would have been born. And this is in Egypt, the stories about Jesus. At the same time in Egypt when the Naj Mahadi manuscripts were being written in the Roman Empire, the same story was going on with Mithra. Mithra. Naj Mahadi, uh, Hindu, you, uh, as I said, 15 major cultures and religions of the world have the same identical story. That alone makes it suspect. But my feeling is if 15 or 16 cultures, including Christianity, if 16 major cultures had the same story, go back and look at the story. Maybe there's something really important, and that's why 16 cultures kept the story. They're telling you something. It's the greatest story ever told. Why? Because it's the only story that's been told. Sixteen cultures have told the same story. It's the war between light and darkness, between intellectual, spiritual brilliance and stupidity and darkness in the minds of men, which is obviously, even to Christians and Jews today, the essence of religion. The religion is to wake up so that it finally, quote, dawns on you. The sun finally dawns on you what's being said here. That it's a symbolic story telling you there's a war between human ignorance and intellectual spiritual enlightenment.
16 major cultures of the world told the same story. That's what makes it a little suspect. But whether there was an actual man, that's irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, if, if, if I followed the interpretation of the Bible as you described it, I would almost come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ was a symbol, really. But besides that, uh, the age of Aquarius, of course, is, is that the, the beginning of the age of Aquarius is that the, is that the culmination of the age of Pisces. Right? Yeah, the culmination. See, here's what you need to understand, that according to the ancient peoples of the world, and all the ancient cultures basically agreed to this, that for 2,160 years, the sun at the equator, if you go down to the equator and stand on the equator, and look straight across into the east, when the sun comes up on the equator every day, there's a, there's a collection of stars right there. And it's the same stars for 2,160 years. The sun rises with that same set of stars. That set of stars is a particular constellation. And it was one, of, one time it was Taurus, Taurus the bull. So it was the golden calf, Taurus the bull, or the sun in the age of Taurus. Then as Taurus moves away, and the next constellation moves in, which is Aries, now it's the sun in the age of Aries, Abram, Father Ram. The Jews blow the ram's horn. The next one in, the, in 2,160 or 50 years later, the next constellation that the sun rises is in Pisces, the two fish. Now Jesus is called the great fisherman, the two fish. He's God's son, the light of the world, who feeds his uh, people with the two fish. Now we're getting ready. If you go down to the equator, you can begin to see the stars coming in. And that constellation that's on its way, it's coming in, but it's not here yet. It's coming in as the age of Aquarius. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. All the Bible is telling you is that every 2,150 years, the sun moves into a new constellation in the heavens. And this is why in Revelation it says that war broke out in heaven. There was a great war in heaven. That's right. The war between the powers of Pisces that has dominated the world and the coming age of Aquarius when the two constellations are battling for dominance over the world at the equator. So there's a war in heaven, star wars. And consequently, there's coming a new world order. And that new world order is based on the constellations of Aquarius. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. This is in the Bible. This is in the scriptures. Consequently, you need to understand that there's something going on here. And it has to do with a very powerful story that's been in operation for thousands of years. Is, is, that, is that what, the, uh, what Hitler meant when he talked about the new world order and George Bush also and the Precisely. installation of a world government is that absolutely absolutely but now here's the point we've been uh, when Adolf Hitler was talking about the new world order Adolf Hitler was into astrology and again Adolf Hitler was many things but stupid wasn't one of them and the Germans the German minds that were around Hitler were not stupid they're not fools. They understood the concepts of the ancient Sumerian. This is why Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were looking for the lost ark. When in Indiana Jones, when the Nazis were up in Tibet looking for the lost ark, why are they looking for the lost ark? Because it has to do with the age of Aquarius. The Nazis knew it. And they want to jump on this story before anybody else gets to it because they know it's coming. And consequently, Indiana Jones was sent by this government to find the ark because the, this government is a lot of things, but stupid isn't one of them. And they know the divine matrix of the heavens is getting ready to change. There's a coming new order in the universe. The old order of Pisces is leaving. A new order of Aquarius is moving in. Somebody better do their homework and find out because the world is changing. Now, in the Bible, there is a concept that the devil takes something that God has made 
and, and licks all over it. I told you that before in one of my lectures, that when I was a child, my dad used to go on Sunday mornings to the, uh, to the donut shop, and he would bring back a, a big bunch of donuts, but there would always be a couple of chocolate donuts. i take the chocolate donuts and lick them and put them back in the box. Why? Be no, serious. Because now those, 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 donut, those two donuts there, they belong to me. Nobody's going to touch them. I licked all of them. They're mine. Okay? And then I started, then, but when you begin to understand, that's what the Bible is saying. The devil has done. The dark side of the force. Those people who are here to do evil and to lie to us, that's what they've done. They have taken something that is beautiful, that is divinely ordained, as the, the march of world powers in the heavens, the, the, the kingdom of heaven is coming down on earth, the implications of the heavens dominating the earth. They have taken that and licked all over it and, and put their own interpretations on it now, so they're going to be in charge of the new world order. Well, we will see which one is going to be in charge of the new world order. The Nazis and the fascists are the almighty God who has ordained this universe to come into being. So I'm saying that if you need to understand that to say the New World Order and the Age of Aquarius, that's from the Bible. Go back and look in Genesis. It talks about the new order of the world that's coming. In the New Testament, it talks about Jesus or the Son of God who will bring the new order that's coming. So I'm saying that the Bible talks about a coming new order and the age of Aquarius. Now the question is, is this coming, is it going to be controlled by God or by the George Bushes of the world? Well, that's what we're talking about, anti-Christ. Anti, incidentally, when you read the word anti-Christ, anti simply means, in our language, the word anti means to be against something. But that's not what the word antichrist in the book of Revelation means. Anti in Greek does not mean to be against. In Latin, anti means to be against. But in the Bible, the word antichrist means the one who would be in the place of Christ. One who would be in the place of the correct one. So anti doesn't mean to, to be against something. It wants to be in the place of it. So I'm saying the bottom line on this whole story of the New World Order and the Age of Aquarius is that God is going to install a new world on the earth. But there's something called an Antichrist, which wants to be there first. They want to jump in on it first because they're clever and smart. The Nazis know. But you better go up to Tibet first. And then you need to go down to Egypt to get the lost ark because it, it, there's nothing it, it's all part of a bigger story so there's a war between Christ Antichrist between the true new world order coming and that which the Bushes would like to jump in on quick before anybody finds out about it and be in charge of it so I'm saying I'm curious to see who's going to win this the Bushes are the almighty God who created this heavens there's some serious problems getting ready to come down on this earth. And when you begin to see it take place, understand that it's, um, it's a metaphysical story. Yes? Okay, we're back to questions and answers. No, we're back to questions. I'm not sure if there'll be any answers. <laughs> you have a brief interpretation of what you feel is meant by the end times. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you brought that one up. I'll talk the next two hours on that one. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I think I said that. We're living in the end times, the last days. Of what? We're living in the end times because if, as all of the ancient civilizations, and I'm talking about China, Asia, Africa, Egypt, <clears throat> Northern Europe, Asia, all over the world, and in every culture, taught the same thing. 
that all that each 2,160 years, and some cultures say 2,150 years. There are one or two cultures that says 2,130 years. But everybody is right around that 2,150 year period, depending on how the, that particular culture counted their time. But everybody was of the opinion that every 2,100 and some odd years, that the world changes, that the whole entire world changes from one astrological sign at the equator to a new astrological sign. And it was called the old order of the ages and the new coming new order of the ages. And so consequently you had the church age, the age of the prophets, and go back into the Bible, go to any good Bible bookstore and look at the books and it's all talking about the end of the age. This goes back to Matthew, the last sentence or the last few sentences in the book of Matthew, the first book in the, Old Te in the New Testament. The first book in the New Testament is Matthew. Go to the very last paragraph and in it you will see where Jesus says, I will be with you to the end of the world and go forth and make, make disciples and bless and make disciples and I will be with you to the end of the world. Look at that word in all the Bible reference works and it will tell you that word in Greek is aeon, A-E-O-N, aeon. Aeon is not world. Aeon is age. So the sun is saying, I will be with you to the end of the age, not world. There is no end of the world. There's an end of the age. And consequently, if there's an end of the age, and there's a, then there's what is coming out to that? Well, there will be a new age. Just as when Moses came down from the mountain, the children of Israel for 2,150 years have been living in the age of Taurus, the golden calf. Moses sees the children of Israel worshiping the golden calf when he's trying to tell them we're, getting, we're going into a new age. At the equator, the, the stars are in the age of Aries, the ram. And consequently, what's wrong with you people, Moses was saying. What's wrong with you guys? Don't you understand? And they're saying, no, that's all that new age stuff. That's all that devil stuff, that new age. We don't want nothing to do with that. We're sticking with the Lord's correct way to, to view things. We are worshiping the golden calf the sun in the age of Taurus. Yeah, but that's fine for 2,150 years, but that's over. It's through, finished, capiche? Wake up. We're starting a new religion. Here is the new law for the new dispensation, the new religion, which is the age of Aries, the ram. So instead of having a golden calf, you need to go out there with the ram's horn and blow the shofar. And now for the next 2,150 years, Jews are say to blow the shofar to show respect for the sun in the age of Ares the ram. And then, after the age of the ram is, is ending, the next age coming in behind it is the age of Pisces. Pisces is the two fish. Jesus' symbol in all the churches in Europe. Go to the churches around and look in the churches and look in their stained glass on churches. Everywhere you will see two fish. The two fish are the symbol of Pisces. 2,150 years the sun is in the age of Pisces. So consequently now we're getting ready to go into the new age of Aquarius. And Christians are today saying the same things the Jews said at the time of Moses. They're saying, oh, all that New Age stuff, that's all of the devil, that's all that crap New Age stuff in astrology. Wake up. The more we change, the more we stay the same. The Jews didn't get it back then. Christians are not getting it today. The universe is getting ready to change. There's a new order of the world coming, whether we like it or not, whether we understand it or not, or whether we agree to it or not, it just don't matter. The heavens are changing. The world is changing. So therefore, it is correct to say we are living in the last days, the end times of the age of Pisces. And now, 
we're getting ready to enter into the new world order or a new world based on God's son in the age of the water bearer, Aquarius. And consequently, as I said, the question you need to be asking yourself, if this is what the Bible is saying, that there's a new age of Aquarius coming, and that's what it says, then who is going to be in charge of that new age? Will it be the God force, the spirit, the divine presence in the universe, godly spirit on the earth that will clean up this earth, it will clean up all of the dirt of the earth and begin a whole new order like Noah after the flood? Is there going to be a whole new world order based on godliness and, and, and decency and honor for the next 2,150 years coming in the future when a new order of the world will be established? Or is it going to be the same guys who have run the old order are going to come back and take over the new order? That's a very interesting question because I'd like to get into the symbols of that. Washington, D.C., the symbols on the back of the dollar bill. How many Christians today and Jews realize, understand this, in the Old Testament, the, sim the word for the Messiah in the Old Testament is the word chief cornerstone. It's used in the book of Isaiah. It's used in the book of Psalms. In the book of Isaiah and Psalms in the Old Testament talks about the Messiah. And the word it uses for the Messiah is chief cornerstone. The builders reject it. Then in the New Testament, once in 1 Peter and once in the book of Revelation, the New Testament calls Jesus the chief cornerstone the builders rejected. And both places, both in the Hebrew uh, talking about Messiah and in the New Testament talking about Jesus, the word is chief cornerstone cornerstone. Look up the word in Hebrew and look it up in Greek and it will tell you that the, the word is a triangle on top of a pyramid. In Hebrew a chief cornerstone is a Hebrew word which means the pinnacle of a pyramid. In the Greek and the, in the Corneic Greek which is street Greek and the New Testament was written in Corneic Greek. In the Corneic Greek the word for, for Jesus was the chief cornerstone the builders rejected. That Greek word means a triangle perched on top of a pyramid. Consequently, according to the Old Testament and the Bible, the New Testament about Jesus, the Messiah is referred to and symbolized by a triangle on top of a pyramid. Period. End of sentence. Okay? What does that mean? What are the implications on the back of the dollar bill? Where is this stuff really going? And what are we doing here? Because the deeper you get into it, the scarier it gets. But I want to tell you, God is too big for one religion. And as, as one of my teachers many years ago said, if you can explain something to an audience about God so that people can understand it, then that would prove conclusively that you don't know anything. Because any God that your pea-sized, ignorant, ill-informed, and unread brain can understand is not that divine presence in the universe that causes all life to be. Because the universe is not only stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. So consequently, when you talk about God, you need to realize you're talking about the powers of the universe. And that divine power in the universe really just doesn't care what we understand, or if we get it. It just don't matter. There is a new world order coming. It is the symbol, it's symbolized in the Bible by a triangle and a pyramid. That's Hebrew and that's Greek. That's the Bible. The question is, is it going to be overseen by a divine force that we call the Christ, or will it be overseen by an antichrist? There are two powers vying for world power now. The forces of light and the forces of darkness. That's the name of the tomb. It's symbolic. It's a metaphor. But I can guarantee you there's something else bigger going on. 
and the people behind the world powers know this subject better than any of us, and they know what they're planning. Yes. Um, I would like to ask. I don't know if they, is that turned on now. Um, I would like to ask how um, the Mayan calendar looks in a con uh, in a context of the Bible and what you talk. Yeah, the Mayan the Does Mayan it calendar has anything to do with it, or there's any oh, connection? Oh yeah, you can bet on it. <laughs> Should I read it or just throw it away? Because <laughs> I was wondering. Yeah, the Mayan calendar there again. What are you talking about? It's a calendar event. The Mayan calendar is, in, is the implications are something's going to happen on a calendar date. Okay? So, yes, the Mayan calendar plays into this. Um, what was his name? Charles Belitz. Charles Belitz. I have the book. It's very difficult to find. Called uh, Doomsday 1999. Charles Belitz, brilliant author, wrote a book called Doomsday 1999 in which he took all of the ancient writings of the world that talked about the end of the world, the last days, the end times, and told you what each of the ancient cultures said about the last days and the end times. And he went through the Mayan calendar, the Hopi prophecies, and uh, the Egyptian prophecies, and the Babylonian Sumerian prophecies. All of them talked about a calendar time. Things are going to happen according to the calendar. Particular days and months are coming, and certain things are going to happen. Um, <clears throat> so yes, the, the Mayan calendar plays into this. The Mayans knew prophecies. The ancient peoples in, in Chaldea have prophecies. All the ancient peoples of the world have prophecies. All of them were based on the astrological story of the Zodiac. All of them. So I'm saying that there is something to this whole story, and we don't have it all yet. And I'm suggesting that what we might want to do is start looking at astrology and not putting it down, but start seriously looking into the Bible and trying to figure out what are the scriptures telling us and what's coming on the earth. Something serious is about to happen on the face of the earth. And I am totally convinced there is a new world order coming. I'm just scared to death that the people that are on this earth have no idea in the world what any of this means and are going to be sitting ducks. But many will look with their eyes and not see and listen with their ears and not hear and with the heart not get the sense of what I'm saying here. Yes? I would like to know how I can get an old dollar bill that didn't have the triangle and the all-seeing eye. It was during Roosevelt's administration when they changed this. However, when the country was founded, back in, even in 1776, 1774, the founding fathers of the country had already decided that that was going to be uh, on, the, uh, on our national coat of arms would be a pyramid with the all-seeing eye. And you say, why? That's as far back as 1774, two years before the Constitution. So the Declaration of Independence. And so consequently, uh, that symbol is very, very old. And where did they get that from? Well, they got it from the Jews. Mm -hmm. Or where did the Jews get it from? Well, they got it from the Egyptians. Where did the Egyptians get it from? Well, they got it from the Sumerians. Wait a minute. Why were the founding fathers, why did the Masonic order decide to have the revolution in 1776? It's because in the Hebrew uh, numerology, in Jewish numerology, eight is the number of new beginnings. In Hebrew numerology, eight is the number of a new beginning. You have seven days, the eighth begins a new beginning, okay? Okay. Why is it called the, the number of new beginnings? It's because it's a symbol this way of infinity. Eight is the only number that you don't have to lift a pencil. You can always start anew. You're always starting anew. So eight was the number of beginning something new. Thirteen was the number for government. It was perfect government in the ancient Semitic uh, numerology. Thirteen was the number of perfect government. Consequently, why? Because of the sun, 
with his 12 helpers. The son with his 12 chosen one makes Jesus and the 12. The son and the 12 signs make 13. So 13 is the number of heavenly government. The son and his chosen 12. Consequently, when the Masons decided to have the revolution, they were going to have it in 1776. Okay? 1776 is 1 in 7 equals 8. 1 in 7 is 8. 7 in 6 is 13. New beginnings on perfect government. That's why 1776, 8 and 7 and 6 is 13. This is why today, when you drive by uh, uh, the oil company, uh, Union Oil, they have an orange globe, and it's got a 76, and it says, get the spirit, the spirit of 76. What do you think that orange globe is? It's the sun. The sun is the orange globe, and 76 is 13, the Masonic order of new government, based on Jesus and his 12, the sun and its 12. Get the spirit, the spirit of revolution. Revolt against those other oil companies and come to us. But that's the symbol of the orange globe. Get the spirit, the spirit of 76. You need to understand Jewish, Freemasonic, occult symbolism. Yes. We have uh, right here behind you. I'm curious, um, these 15 different other cultural accounts of a um, son of God on earth, do they all share the approximate time frame, or do they vary as far oh, as... Oh, no, 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 the, no, no, so no, they do Some not, of them no. vary like a thousand years between accounts? Yes. No, they do not share the same time frame at all. Some of them do. So. Like there are, there are lapses where one civilization is going down and a new civilization is, is coming up. And at the same time, they both have the same story. But one is one race of people and one's another. But they have the same story. But usually, those 15 or 16, and the 16th one is Christianity. But the 15 before Christianity goes all the way back into the most ancient of, uh, and ancient history. Okay, uh, and so you know, it comes down through ancient history, and different cultures have different stories, and they're all identical. Another uh, question I'd like you to elaborate on: If um, you you were saying essentially religion is the juxtaposition of knowledge and illumination versus uh, darkness and ignorance, right? Um, paint that over the account in the Garden of Eden. Oh well, now see now when you're getting into Genesis, I was talking about the New Testament. Now, if you want to get into Genesis, that's my favorite subject in the Old Testament. I'd like to hear your take yeah. with that as a viewpoint. Well, when you get into Genesis, first of all, in the Genesis 1-1, I mean, Genesis is exciting because Genesis comes from gen Isis. Gen is the word for generation, to generate something. Where it begins is to generate. Isis in, in Egypt was female wisdom. You put the two together, and it becomes Gen Isis, or Genesis. Um, let, me, let me show you something. Isis, Isis was spelled I-S-I-S, -I -S, Isis. Isis represented in Egypt spiritual, feminine spiritual wisdom, Isis. But Pharaoh Akhenaten came into the picture, and he outlawed the religion of Isis and reestablished a new religion, the worship of the sun. And the new religion was the worship of Amen Ray, A-M-E-N-R-A. Amun Ray, Amen Ray, Amun Ray. And so in Egypt, those who used to worship Isis are now taught to worship Amun Ray or Amen Ra which is where we get the sun ray. Right. Consequently, they were told to talk to God through God's son. <clears throat> amen, ray. So at the end of their prayer, they would say amen. And this is why today we still say amen, because the son was called amen, ra, amen, ray. However, 
<clears throat> when they hixed those people who we today call the Israelites, they were called Hyksos. When the Hyksos people left out of Egypt and went north into Palestine, and incidentally the word Palestine comes from a Sanskrit word pala in Hindu. Pala means a male phallic. A male erection is a pala. And stein is a word in the Phoenician Canaanite language for a rock. So it's a cock, hard as a rock. It's called Palestine. Okay? <clears throat> Consequently, you have Isis, Amun Ra, and when the, and when the, uh, and when the uh, Hyksos people went out of Egypt, went north into Palestine, they encountered a Palestinian god, the planet Saturn. Saturn was the god of the Palestinians. Still is. His name was El. E-L. Okay? El was the name of the planet Saturn. When you take Isis, I-S, Amun Re, Ra, R-A, and the new god Saturn, El, it becomes Israel. Israel is Isis. Ra and El. The three names of the ancient gods of the ancient world. Israel is Isis, Amun Ra, and El. There's nothing holy in Israel except the stories. They're full of holes. Do your homework. Well, the Star of David is a symbol of. Uh, the Star of David. The Star of David. First of all, there was no David, so the, so the Star of David is unimportant because there was no David. But the Star of David, if you look it up in encyclopedias, go to encyclopedias or reference works on ancient Semitic religion, all the reference works will tell you that the Star of David <clears throat> was originally the star of the planet Saturn. The Star of David is the star of Saturn, and Saturn was called El, E-L. Consequently, if you worship the planet Saturn, you were an elder. Okay, and how did you get to be an elder? You got elected. And now that you are elected to be an elder, you are now one of the elites because you've been elevated in society. How did you get to be elites? You, because you have the juice, the juice, electricity which causes things to work. It's the juice. You need to understand the way the secret societies and fraternal orders use words and terms and symbols in religion and government. There's a world of difference between religion and spirituality. That's all I'm saying. One last question. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know where it's at and what it really signifies? Oh, yeah. The Ark of the Covenant, the reason why Indiana Jones was going to... Uh, uh, to the Tibet first and he encounters the Nazis in Tibet they're looking for the lost ark why would they go to Tibet first and the Nazis are not stupid why would they be up in Tibet because they know that if you're going to find the lost ark you better start in Tibet because the whole subject is about something that's happening in Tibet and you didn't know it but Steven Spielberg knows it so consequently, and the Nazis knew it and that's why they were in Tibet now, once you get the key, and the metaphor in the movie was a crystal. You know, that's the crystal that's going to show you where it is. Well, the, what we're talking about is a metaphor, a symbolic key. The symbolic key to understanding the lost ark is in Tibet. Now, once you get that key, and you understand what the key now to, to finding the lost ark, now you go to Egypt, not the Holy Land, Egypt. And there you are going to find the Holy Ark, the Lost Ark of the Covenant. But the Lost Ark of the Covenant is a very ancient story in Egypt. It's called the Ark of the Contract. The Ark of the Contract, and there are pictures. I showed it here one night, if you'll recall. I showed the pictures of the Lost Ark in Egypt, on the temples, and all the t and many of the temples in Egypt are carved up on the walls, uh, men carrying this ark with the angels' wings, and they're carrying it with, with, uh, with handles. It's identical to the Ark of the Covenant. What I am saying to you is that the Ark of the Covenant is just a story. 
the Jews have given us a great story called the Ark of the Covenant. There was no Ark of the Covenant. There was an Ark of the Contract. That's Egyptian, not Jewish. And that's why Steven Spielberg has Indiana Jones going to Egypt to look for the lost Ark because it has nothing to do with the Jewish people whatsoever. It is an Egyptian story. It is an Egyptian symbol. And in Egypt it was called the Ark of the Contract. Not the Ark of the Covenant, but in Hebrew, a covenant, covenant is a contract. So the ancient Egyptians, way before the Hebrews ever dreamt it up, has something called the Ark of the Contract. Go to an encyclopedia, a reference work, and do something exciting that you've never done in your life. Read a book. Wake up. Do something really strange and off the wall. Do some research. Go to a library and start researching Ark of the Covenant and you're going to find out there was no Ark of the Covenant. It's just a great Jewish story like all the other stories that come out of Israel. None of it's true. The whole thing is made up. $29.95, get uh, Charlton Heston to play Moses. $29.95, no up and no down. And we've got a whole religion here and haven't got the faintest idea of where